We are live in five, four, three, two, one. We are live. Gardiboni sir, you wanted to have a welcome speech? Oh yes. yes. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Good evening, everybody. I am very much thankful to R2 TV for organizing the Young Surgeons Forum by the Young Surgeons, for the Young Surgeons, and of the Young Surgeons. I am here only to guide this and facilitate this, facilitate, facilitate this program so that the younger generation should come forward for presentation as well as disseminating their knowledge throughout the world. I thank every but here, those who are attending this webinar and as well the faculty from, especially from USA, Dr. Ashish Shaha and Panchavarni, both are uh, in their busy schedule, they have find out some time to dissipate their knowledge to our viewers. All faculties are here. They are well known. Mahesh Soni, Girish Motwani, Chandaksha, uh, Parth Gavatre, Nitin Kimatkar, Vijayanand Lokhande, Yogesh Salfade, and there are all <coughs> stalwarts in the trauma surgery. And this is, we have started this series of uh, foot and ankle here. Next time, we will have a theme of infection around the ankle, primary, secondary infections, acute, chronic, tubercular, fungal, and from the implant infection. <laughs> So this is how it is. And now I hand over to Manoj Pahukar and Girish Motwani to conduct further proceedings and scientific program. I request you all yeah. uh, faculties be in time and so that we can have a better interaction with the young people all around the world. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Gadigone, sir. And uh, very good evening to all of you. So we are starting uh, with this uh, second session. So as you all know, this Young Surgeon Forum already, uh, we had first session on 4th of June, where it, the topics on insights into the ankle injury was discussed. And it was very successful with over 2000 viewers for that program. So the, today we are having our second session for this Young Surgeon Forum. The theme for today is about insights into midfoot and hind foot trauma. So the convener for today's program is uh, Dr. Vasudev Gadigone, who is our mentor, the guiding uh, uh, all of us and giving opportunity to present our work on this platform. Along with me, Dr. Girish Motwani is a moderator. Uh, I must appreciate Girish for his wonderful uh, uh, designing and uh, conceptualizing of this program. And uh, we are having uh, four eminent panelists uh, from across India, Dr. R.M. Chandak sir from Nagpur, Dr. Yogesh Salfade from Chandrapur, Dr. Nitin Kimatkar from Nagpur, and Dr. Vijayananda Lokhande from Pune. At the outset, I must thank uh, two U.S. expert faculties in the foot and ankle surgeon for graciously accepting our invitation. And uh, in a short time, they could give us their valuable time for our today's symposium. The first faculty is uh, Dr. Vinod Panjbhavi. He is a professor and chief of foot and ankle surgeon at University of Texas, Galveston. He has many contributions uh, in his name, but mainly I would like to highlight these innovative techniques which has developed the keyhole surgeries, especially in the fixation of pylon fractures, the endoscopic gastrocnemius release, the harvesting tendons through these mini incision techniques, the per peroneal tendoscopy, the bunion surgery. He is also an editor in chief of Journal of Techniques in Foot and Ankle Surgery. So I welcome Dr. Vinod Panjabhavi. And our second eminent uh, USA faculty is Dr. Ashisha, who is an associate professor, director of uh, foot and ankle orthopedic research fellowship. And again, he has got a vast experience and uh, various uh, uh, credits uh, to, his, to his name in various national and international uh, publications. Uh, I would like to highlight these three important uh, uh, aspects, uh, which he has much interest, like he has written this neuromuscular disorders in foot and ankle. Then he has very special interest in adult acquired flat foot and tarsal tunnel release. So I welcome Dr. Ashisha. 
So friends, we are already having this first session on uh, ankle injuries. Now moving ahead, uh, we are today. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Yeah. So we are having this second session today is about the hind foot, the calcaneus and talus and the mid foot with uh, various uh, tarsal bones today. So we have divided uh, today's session into six uh, sections. We are having five cases and uh, one uh, didactic uh, expert lecture from Dr. Vinod Pajbhavi. So uh, there will be five cases of 15 minutes duration is the first case will be about this uh, complex talar fracture. And uh, for this, we are having Dr. Parth uh, from Akola, who will be speaking on Hawking's type three talus fracture. The second uh, case uh, will be by Dr. Mahesh Soni, who will be speaking uh, on uh, this uh, open ankle injury associated with a talus fracture. He's an eminent faculty from the uh, Ankaleshwar, and uh, he has got a, uh, uh, numerous uh, um, cases uh, which we could show with good results. Then third uh, case is uh, by Dr. Girish Motwani, who is again an eminent foot and ankle surgeon from Nagpur. And uh, he will be discussing about Sanders three calcaneal fracture and especially he will be dealing as to uh, how and what to do in cases where there is a poor soft tissue. Then next, uh, we sometimes come uh, with these cases coming to our OPD with uh, neglected calcaneal fractures, then with deformities. So how to tackle them? So we do have uh, another young budding uh, foot and ankle surgeon from uh, New Delhi, uh, Dr. Abhishek Jain, and who will be guiding us from the neglected uh, malunating calcaneal fracture case scenario. The later on, we do have this uh, complex uh, list frank injury. And for this, uh, another uh, uh, young dynamic uh, uh, surgeon from New Delhi, Dr. Ankit Khurana, will be dealing uh, a case uh, of complex list frank injury. And in the end, uh, we'll be having this expert lecture by Dr. Vinod Pajbhavi, who will give us an expert approach uh, to manage the talar avian, which is still uh, having many years controversies as to how do we go ahead with the, with the treatment in these uh, various uh, uh, patterns of this uh, talus uh, avian. So this is a brief program for about two hours, which you are going to have. So uh, I welcome you all and let's put the best foot forward. And I welcome uh, Dr. Parth Gavatre, to share his screen and uh, start his presentation on uh, Hawking's uh, type 3 talus fracture. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen now. I hope my screen is visible to everyone. Yes, Parth, you can go ahead, yeah. Okay, okay. So, uh, good evening, everybody. So, I will be starting with my case. Uh, this was a 21-year-old male who had accidental fall from height in a well. The duration of trauma at presentation was five days. Uh, patient had no significant medical history. Uh, I'll be sharing the x-ray now. So, this is the x-ray of the patient. So it's actually actually a type 2A fracture uh, of talar neck. Uh, there is subluxation of the subtalar joint. Lateral process fracture is also there. So actually it cannot be classified into the Hawkins type. Uh, uh, but but still, uh, and then, then there were no associated bony injuries to the patient. Uh, I'll be sharing the CTs now. So this is a coronal CT of the uh, uh, ankle joint. So you can see a large, large lateral process fracture there in the image. This is the sagittal image of the talar neck fracture. This is the transverse CT image, which again okay, shows the left. Come again. Hello. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is the transverse CT image. Which shows a talar neck process, uh, talar neck fracture along with the lateral process fracture. So actually, in this uh, in this particular case, instead of the varus malalignment that we usually see in such fractures, we had valgus malalignment because it 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 had some other associated injury also. So uh, this was the 3D CT image of the same patient again. 
so the issues that i faced in this case were there the uh, there are two page there were the skin uh, issues and the bony issues also the patient had rheumatoid blisters there was significant edema that was there Uh, the skin was quite contused when the patient presented, and there was the uh, bony impingement of the skin uh, due to the lateral process fracture. Uh, bony issues that were there were valgus malalignment, rotational malalignment. There was medial neck combination, and there was a separate lateral process fragment that need to be addressed. So uh, my approach was uh, guided by these principles that in type one and type two, uh, which are rarely open, we can wait. we can wait till the soft tissue envelope improves so that the chances of wound dehiscence and wound complications are reduced in type 3 and 4 fractures uh, which are mostly open there uh, there is a, a, a need for urgent intervention uh, early close reduction is essential to reduce the uh, fracture displaced fracture fragments and uh, dislocations so that you reduce the pressure on the skin and the uh, uh, skin can attain a health uh, the envelope can uh, attain a healthy we can attain which we can get a healthy envelope for uh, further management in unstable fractures uh, external fixation is essential to maintain the reduction sometimes so uh, in this particular case i used a dual approach uh, i had and i used anterior medial and anterior lateral approaches both yeah. so the advantage of using both approaches that is that i got maximal exposure of the talar neck uh, and you can actually visualize the lateral column and medial column so when the medial column is comminuted so during fixations uh, you uh, tend to over compress the medial column sometimes so that 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 can be avoided by direct visualization there so uh, the essential uh, instruments and implants that i needed were distractors mm -hmm. finger retractors lamina spreaders k wire stinman pin shan spins and counter sinks Uh, I kept four mm CC screw, partial and fully threaded Herbert screws, and uh, mini plates as well. So uh, the pitfalls mm -hmm. in this case are that there is dorsal medial talar neck combination most of the times, and the talar neck is in varus and extension. Though that though in this case it was in valgus uh, malalignment. So intraoperative canal views are essential along with the routine AP and lateral views and the fluoroscopic images that we have. So uh, the osteonecrosis incidence. And is to 20 to 25 percent in this particular uh, Hopkins type, and it is dictated by the initial injury, uh, displacement, combination, and open fractures. So these are a few intraop images that I had, uh, which shows the provisional fixations done by K wire, and uh, rotational uh, malalignment, which was corrected by a transverse shan spin into the talar head. So it was derotated. The talar head was derotated and uh, was brought in alignment with the talar body. And uh, the varus and valgus malalignment could also be again corrected with the same particular uh, Stinman pin that was passed through the talar head, and which came out, which could be handled well through both the approaches. So, this was the intraoperative fluoroscopic image. This was a. X-rays of the patient in one and a half months, and again the X-rays at four months follow, which was showing quite good union. So these were the clinical images of the patient at five days, and at four months. So the scar and everything was healed. The skin was uh, in good shape, and the range of motion of the ankle at four months. so so the patient was allowed full weight bearing at 4 months the patient was quite comfortable there was no antalgic gait so the precautions that we need to take in such cases is the most important thing is to achieve anatomic reduction and restoration of peritellar articular surfaces uh, and if at all there are displaced fractures and dislocations then they need they need to be urgently addressed urgently reduced uh, the important thing is to uh, scrutinize your coronal sagittal and axial images uh, because uh, the 3d reconstructions are limited by the software used and it is and there is volume rendering as well 
so the more important thing is to uh, view viewer coronal sagittal axial images thoroughly uh, delayed definitive fixation is the most important thing because then you can avoid uh, multiple wound issues uh, the flap need to be of full thickness and there should be adequate screen bridge while using dual approaches the subtalar joint should be inspected and it there should be thorough lavage given to uh, remove the osteochondral fragments if at all they are present and uh, for reduction intraoperative reduction you should rely on the lateral talar neck cortical reeds because medial neck is most of the times comminuted so uh, you can rely on the lateral talar neck thank you a good presentation part uh, very nicely covered beautifully on time uh, but uh, we will have few quick questions and uh, yeah. i would like to uh, yes sir start screen screen i think we will like to see some x rays in between if you want yes. to have some discussion yeah gadi gun sir if you allow we can have uh i have one question to yeah. ask to uh, dr pat yes sir but can you can you please put your uh, pre operative x ray yeah yeah i'll do that again yeah. you have to share the screen and put a pre operative x ray just okay. put and leave it yeah yes mm -hmm. yeah kibat kar sir please hey uh, dr parth said that he there was a some medial comminution and still he has used one 4 mm cc screw uh, which was uh, which was only 16 mm threaded yeah yes sir you need nationally in that or you need to put sometimes a fully threaded screw uh, yeah actually uh, the medial screw should be positional screw you are right sir but in this particular case the medial combination was not there that much so i could uh, uh, use this screw and uh, i did tightening of the screw so the compression was done under vision so i didn't Uh, yeah, I didn't over tighten the screw there. Okay, I I, but, I thought it other way that there was medial combination there. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. But can you elaborate the sequence of the fixation, medial to lateral, anterior to posterior? Yeah, I can show the images also in property image. So the provisional uh, fixation was done by K Y. So the lateral process in the first image you can see the lateral process has been fixed, and the uh, K Y S. one wire is pushed transversely transversely through the talar head so it was used to derotate and get it into the into reduction along uh, uh, with the talar head uh, with the talar body so the uh, my uh, sequence of fixation was my, i did i uh, first put the uh, lateral column screw and then the uh, uh, lateral process uh, screw and finally the medial screw so lateral non compression screw right lateral yes, position yes. screw Yes, so you started yes. with the lateral position, then you Lat lateral compression screw, sir. Lateral compression screw. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. So you said there is a lateral compression. Uh, yeah, actually there was a la large fragment of the lateral process, and uh, uh, there was there were no small pieces, so the combination was not there as such. So once I provisionally fixed the lateral process with the ma main uh, fragments like the body and the neck, uh, I could. Uh, get a uh, clean fracture line, so there I could use compression screw to good effect. So I do, I did that, and then I put the lateral process screw, so I got good compression there. And finally, I put the medial screw, so the medial combination was not there that much, so I could use it into 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 a lag mode. So otherwise, if there would have been a medial combination, I could have I would have uh, put a fully threaded screw there. In that case. Okay. Good. Doctor Park, it appears that the. The teller head is in dorsiflexion. What part? It appears that teller head is in dorsiflexion here. Yeah. You see the teller near vehicle. Sir, so the joint, uh, the opposite opposite sides X-rays were exactly similar. So uh, even I did have that same question. So uh, uh, pardon me that I don't have the other other foot X-rays, but the teller navicular joint of the uh, of the normal foot also was in similar orientation. Yeah, probably it is a hanging foot, so uh, that's why you are getting some sub subluxation at the time. Uh, Doctor Ashish, yeah. sir, sir, how do you? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so um, I mean, I would say first of all, when I compare to the the Taylor's fixation, when I used to, when I started coming back to India seven or eight years ago, 
this is amazing, you know. I can see the way people were doing at a time and what people have evolved, all surgeons. When I see Dr. Sony's x-rays in the forum, I'm sorry, I'm very poor in responding to the messages or writing up, but this is outstanding work, okay? So let me put it a few things, few, few take-home messages, I would put it that way, okay? Uh, because here 10 surgeons will fix 10 different ways, okay? But a but, uh, few take-home messages, number one, CT scan is inevitable. CT scan is must here. That's number one. Number two, if the patient's skin condition not permissible, first X fix, because it's not the injury of the bone, it's the injury of the soft tissue, and try to fix it as, as soon as possible. I'm not saying like you have to fix it in the middle of the night, because I want you to fix it when you, your scrub tech, everybody's in the right set of the mind, okay? Number three, keep try to keep some small mini frag screws. Yeah. Try out 2.7, 2 2.0, because there are so many number of times lateral process of the tailors. If you don't fix it, then what will happen? You get the subtailor instability down the road, right? So keep the 2.7 or 2 -0 smaller, small frag screws and keep the smaller plate as well, like the recon plate and stuff. So keep small frag screws, small frag plates, recon plates, and your small extron fixator. The jazz fixator, the, you guys, it's a very inexpensive in India. Keep that on hand anytime you are doing this fixation. I agree with the speaker like, hey, you always do dual approach. If you see the fracture on the x-ray without CT scan, that means you do dual approach. That's very important. Number two, start with the multiple k -bars, getting the fixation. You, uh, like, uh, uh, Mahesh had, like, you know, very good question, like, hey, how is the dorsiflexion? So basically, you take the x-ray of the opposite talus on your C-arm and try to replicate that. You save that on the opposite side on your C-arm and try to replicate that. Same, it's applicable for talus and calcaneus. Dual approach, don't do periosteal stripping if it's not necessary. Clean the subtalar joint at the same time. If necessary, use the pin distractor or Hinterman distractor, putting one pin in the tibia, one pin in the calcaneus for the visualization. That can be very helpful. Make sure any side you see combination. I agree with like another you know, speaker that mostly is a medial because if it's a medial combination, it can turn into shortening of the medial column, making KO virus deformity. So you put the medial plate, any side there's a combination, you don't try to compress you try to make it more of like, you know, neutralization, stabilization plate to maintain the length. So here, I, if I was here, I would uh, put the plate laterally, the mini frag, okay? So, so that's one thing that can be helpful, the mini frag plate, stabilization of the column. If we don't have a plate, the small external fixator can be very helpful here as well. But the take home message, you need anatomical reduction no periosteal stripping, try to put as many fragments as possible back without the periosteal stripping here, clean up the subtalar joint, check the ankle joint if it's necessary. In my practice, these are big MVAs or motor vehicular accidents. I keep them non-weight bearing for three months, hairless and calcaneous. But you can start mobilization at six weeks depending upon the patient's compliance. But no, great job. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, the screw in the same way or PA screw? PA screw. What is your preference? Posterior to anterior or anterior to posterior? I, I love PA screw because biomechanically it's a more stable and solid construct. Okay. And I'm not violating the telonavicular joint either. Like, number one, my stress fracture of the tailor neck or undisplaced fracture or displaced fracture. Once I stabilize, I do PA screw. But if, if you're doing for the first few times, if you're not done more than 20, 25 tailors, do the AP entry to posterior, okay? Then slowly, once you are okay with the learning more tailors and comfortable, start doing PA screw. It's very satisfactory. 
and it's a beautiful fixation. You will be, have so much satisfaction getting the compression and as well as uh, the fixation across. Yeah, Shishar, okay. one question. Yes. Sir, sir if mm -hmm. interoperatively, if you find after opening the talus in the dual approach, if you find a small, small osteochondral fragment, I mean the small osteochondral uh, pieces, which are not fixable, and like the path is shown on the lateral side, there were a lot of, I mean, because he has not done the lateral middle osteotomy, so probably you have not seen those fragments. So interoperatively, if you find that these are a very non-small fixable fragment, how can we uh, manage interoperatively? You, you if, let's put it this way. If it cannot take a K wire, then it cannot take 1.7 or 2 or screw. If it cannot take a K wire, if it's small fragments, you have to take it out because this will become more of a loose body and yeah. like, you know, more of painful in the future. And again, if the patient is young, like the way we do, like, you know, it's, we consider more as an OCD. You can little, make a poke hole, do a little micro fracture, and hopefully it will generate some fibrocartilage there. Right. Yeah. Th thanks, Park, for such a wonderful case. Can you stop sharing your screen now? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. So yeah, yeah. So thanks for all this wonderful discussion, especially Dr. Ashish and all the faculties. Uh, now we move ahead to our uh, second case for today. So now may I invite uh, Dr. Mahesh Sodi, sir, uh, to start his presentation, and he will be presenting a case of an open ankle injury associated with a talus fracture. So uh, this is more of an uh, uh, ankle fracture associated with talus fracture. So this is a young male. I am audible to? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So he is a young male of around 30 years, presented in the night at around 10 p.m. with open injury. So this is the initial wound. Uh, the deltoid was popping out from the medial wound. There was a fibular combination. There is a sagittal fracture of the talus with a capot fragment visible here. So the, these are the problem. Open injury, torn deltoid ligament, uh, sagittal fracture of the talus body, capot fragment, and fibular combination. The management protocol uh, would be a primary fixation because it's an open wound or a spawn skin and plan uh, uh, in a uh, stage manner. So at this time, uh, we have some question answer. Uh, should I proceed? Yeah, I think yeah, we can have opinion from Dr. Ashish if uh, what would be his plan uh, yes. to proceed further in this case here. So uh, definitely. So I take trauma call like once once a month, and we see this type of things. But you guys see this type of fracture dislocation more than we see here. Uh, first of all, okay. it's number one, it's very important that thorough debridement, external fixator, right? Because it's not the only the bone injury, but soft tissue injury. You put the external fixator in the first stage and soft tissue debridement, you clean out, you wash out with a nine liter of normal saline, take all of the bad stuff out, IV antibiotic, whatever the protocol that we have, right? To prevent the infection. Yeah. And I will not let I will not sit on it for months or weeks. But what we do, we put the here at least in states. We start with the external fixator, clean up everything, take the patient in the surgery again in forty eight within forty eight hours. Okay, then go for the definitive okay. fixation at the time. Yep. Okay. Yeah. On the same day, same night, you yeah. will go for. Same night. Yeah, so same same night. I see the thing is, uh, I, I put it in this way. Putting the external fixator is the 20 minutes procedure for you, right? You put the external fixator, clean up. Yes, this is 3B. And if it's contamination, 
Yes, you yeah. you better just okay. do it same day or same night. I agree yeah. with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Abhishek or Ankit, uh, do you have any another opinion uh, for this case? Like, do you do this thing differently, or you even do it at two stages? So obviously, uh, st stage management is uh, something that I would prefer, and uh, I would uh, uh, if if these patients do present and they are fairly common in our part of the world, and uh, yeah, yeah. so. My priority would be to fix the talus and to span the ankle, uh, letting the plastic surgeon do his job at the same time or in a staged way, and then going on to definitive fixation of the ankle fracture in a subsequent sitting. But uh, talus fracture, if I'm going in, putting in an external fixator, I would put in the screws for the talus uh, at the very first go. So that would be my uh, way of yeah, managing. That's the addition, that's yeah, that's addition you will do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Sony, sir. Proceed ahead. Uh, I did in the morning, this, this, this fixation, this was done around six years ago. The injury was in 2016, uh, early six, 2016. So this was my mistake probably that uh, I took this definitive fixation on the very first day. Here uh, we can see the problem. Uh, the carpet fragment is now well reduced. It was fixed with a screw without opening the fracture site. The fibula appears shortened here. Uh, the talus was fixed with two cc screw. It appears uh, good. So the reduction was not proper. Cabot figure was not uh, was malreduced. Then there was fibula shortening. So the uh, post-op X-ray uh, uh, on the uh, fifth January two thousand sixteen, the problem starts now. Serious discharge started uh, coming, and persisted. It persisted in spite of the proper antibiotic coverage. And there was failing of the fixation. As you can see, the, uh, the ankle is going into valgus. Again, follow-up X-ray in the February 2016. The ankle joint uh, was failing. There was some uh, loss of teller cartilage here, and uh, some notch was uh, visible here. Yes. So after say eight nine months uh, of the initial injury, I took the decision to fuse his ankle. This was done to uh, uh, for fusion, two cross screws and one screw for the fibula. Follow-up X-ray, patient present, presented with broken screw while walking. He was allowed to walk and he presented with broken screw on the fibular side and pain on the medial side on walking. This is the final follow-up three years post-injury. The ankle is fused, the broken screw is visible, patient is walking. These are clinical photos of the same patient. This was the site which was operated. This is the gate video of the same patient. There is some valgus mild alignment, but he is comfortable. So now we can proceed for the discussion in this case. So uh, question, Mahesh. If this patient comes right now to you, let's say tonight, yeah. what would yeah. be your, what would be the next, take us through the step by step. Yeah, now I will go for the, uh, st uh, the stage planning like uh, debridement and x on the very first day and probably tell us fixation in the same sitting. Then I will go for the CT scan. Then we'll go for the formal open reduction of the fibula and the separate fragment to get the things in proper place. And as you said, uh, thorough debridement is must to prevent the infection. The, this case was failed because of the infection. Also, the fixation was not poor, not up to the mark. As you can see in the previous X-ray. Yeah. This is the image, uh, this is the post yes, X-ray. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So can anybody comment on what could have been additionally done at this stage of fixation? Like, yes, do please. you feel the ankle is still subluxated, the fibular distraction and shortening is still there, the inferior tibia fibular joint syndesmosis is still not reduced. So what are the problems here? Like, can anyone? Yes, Ashish, sir. So um, one, one comment here before I move forward. Uh, you know, I hear the comment of fixing the talus in the same sitting. 
But just think about when you don't have CT scan, when you don't, when you know there is a deltoid injury and stuff, you can't fix anything, specifically this type of polytrauma patient. So I would, I would advise or I would recommend when you see this type of fracture dislocation, you don't need CT scan right away. You debris, put the X fix, and do CT scan after putting the X fix. With the ligamento taxes and stuff, you'll be able to reduce so many fragments, okay? And yeah. then you can plan out better with the surgery here. So that's a very important. You do debridement. X fix, then you do CT scan for this patient, okay? So that will save the money. I agree with the, we, the, our learning, Taylor's neck fracture fix ASAP. You know, we should do on the, as soon as possible or emergent basis. But at the same time, Taylor neck or Taylor body. But if I don't know more of the geography or more of the, you know, uh, about the fracture, I'll be a little hesitant to do the fixation. Uh, sorry. And the next one, what, what was the question, sir? Please, can you tell me? Like, uh, what would have been the fallacies in that fixation? And uh, once this fixation has failed, so would you go for this ankle fusion or replacement uh, in this case? Yes. So, so one thing is, uh, like Mahesh already uh, pointed out, I mean, here the CT scan would have been helpful because there was not only the talus fracture, but this was more like a pilon fracture variant, right? Intraarticular fracture of the tibia. So yeah. we could have got the length of the fibula, more of the fixation of all of the fragment along with the talus. Let's say if it fails in my practice, okay? If it fails in my practice, then number one, uh, I, I will go because if it's a younger patient, non-diabetic, non-smoker, I will go with the ankle fusion here. But that's why when you are doing the ankle fusion here, it's very important, not only the ankle three views of the x-rays, but you check the axial view or the Salzman view. You need to see where your calcaneus stand, okay? Because here, your fusion, like, and again, this is not only Mahesh. I have fused my ankles in valgus as well. Okay, but if this is the case, I will do axial view, calcaneus view, and see if needed, I can pass the vector of doing the, adding the calcaneal osteotomy, or I start with the compressing on the other side. So instead of pulling on laterally, okay, I will start pulling from medially first, okay? And if this patient is diabetic, if there was a more, Talus involved on the subtalar side as well. I will do the TTC fusion for this type of patient. And again, this type of cases, nobody can win, okay? And you need to really have balls to present this case uh, to show yeah, negative. Yeah, yes. Yeah, great. Sir, wonder, yes, a great follow up with Dr. Mysore, sir. I have for all yeah, these cases. Yeah. Let me ask Dr. Vinod, sir, in, in, in summary, the last, uh, this was the sequence of the open talar injury open ankle injury with the uh, with the medial big bone. Uh, Mahesh, sir, can you please put on the first x-ray? First clinical picture. And so, so, so this was our beginning of this case. I hope you have not seen it. So, and whatever you have seen in your, in the follow-up thing, it has gone into the ankle fusion uh, after the control of the infection. So, sir, if you are dealing the same situation, what is your plan on day one? Oh, this is an interesting case. So, um, <clears throat> obviously, in a severe soft tissue trauma, uh, which we don't see on x-rays, and obviously, you have a clinical picture with a complete disruption of the deltoid ligament, you see. So, you have no medial uh, stabilization structures here uh, for the ankle. But, you know, you have an opportunity to use that wound to get the Taylor body fixed very well. Okay. So, you know, obviously, the principles are the same. So, we need to get the Taylor body or the tail fractures reduced first, and then restore the length of the fibula. See, so it's very comminuted. So you don't want to devascularize those fragments, but yet you need to get the length right. And there might be a disruption between the, uh, the fibula and the tibia, but you also see anterolateral fragment. You see the anterolateral fragment 
of the distal tibia, we see, which there might be an anteropost, uh, sorry, posterior lateral fragment as well of the tibia, uh, which we don't see on this AP radiograph. So we need to figure out, you know, how this injury occurred. So, you know, there was a, a comminuted butterfly kind of scenario for the fibula, you see. So the forces, it looks like a severe abduction forces, which has knocked off, uh, we, what we can see is an anterior lateral fragment of the distal tibia and possibly the posterior, la uh, posterior lateral fragment of the distal tibia and completely took off the me medial deltoid structure. Therefore, you have a transverse wound, you see. So everything failed. It's a severe form of abduction injury, which is actually knocked off the tibial, uh, uh, sorry, the tailor body as well. You know, you kind of have a vertical fracture going back from the anterior to posterior aspect of the talus, tailor dome. Obviously, you know, debridement, you have to do a debridement, thorough debridement, and, um, you know, you start fixing. Uh, you can certainly, uh, you know, get the length of the fibula um, if the soft tissues allow you, which I think you should, which is within 24 hours you're seeing this, right? With it, I, I hope so. And, you know, you, I, I used uh, vancomycin and irrigation, uh, you know, and everything possible to prevent uh, infection in here. So those are the principles. So getting the body, because you can use the opportunity here, you see, you know, thoroughly visualize accurate reduction of the tailor body, get the length and provide stability anteromedially, antero, sorry, anterolaterally for the tibia and posterolaterally perhaps. I don't see a fragment there, but if there is one, you need to provide that. that what, what that does is not only brings the fibula down, but also provides the stability on the lateral column of the of the tibia of the of the tibia fibular art articulation now after you do that you also need to i think there is some combination in the medial nalulus too <clears throat> uh, i can't see it on the x-ray but if there is then you might need to do tension band wiring or whatever necessary to bring those fragments together in the medial nalulus in addition to that we want to make sure that the tailor body sits very close in the medial gutter you see now you can do that indirectly by putting a lateral plate, very long lateral plate on the fibula using very low syndesmotic screws so that, uh, so, so that it does not drift. You see, so I don't like, and if you look at the plate here, there is already a curvature, you see, which is kind of bringing the lower end of the distal, this distal, yes. distal aspect of the plate. It's dragging the fibula, uh, fibular fragment out. You see, I, I kind of under contour or actually make the plate straight. You understand? So. So you have actually a contour with a convexity facing laterally. So when you, when you put those screws in, it actually pushes the distal fibula and the talus towards the medial malleus. You can, I don't, I don't hesitate in putting a suture anchor in the talus and then actually attaching it to the medial malleus so that you're not only pushing the fibula from laterally, but also dragging the talus into the gutter. See, so, those are the things I would do, obviously, and pray. You know, um, the fibula, because it is comminuted, you see, so you do not know how the distal fibula, rotation wise, length wise, anterior posterior displacement wise, is difficult to, to recreate all that, you see. But if you get the medial, medial gutter reduced well and the tail is, is stable in the medial aspect, and then you do everything else on the lateral aspect, it's great. It is, it's a very plastic situation. You see, if you push too much from the lateral side, it'll be too much away in the medial side. And if you underdo it, then the talus will drift laterally. So, you know, it, it's a technically very demanding situation, to be honest, you know. Even at the end of all doing that, you know, it might get infected and you may go into fusion. But at, yeah. at, at this initial stage, you want to do everything you can to respect the soft tissues, to get the joint uh, aligned as best as you can, and obviously thorough debridement and, and prevention of infection. Yeah. Thank you, Vinod sir. Good case by Mahesh yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. May, yeah. I, may I ask to the experts? Yes, Girish, may I ask to the experts? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, this is a compound injury. You don't know what is going to happen about the infection one and the secondary osteoarthritis second. So, do we explain to the patient that ultimately this patient may go for a ankle arthrodesis is uh, when we explain the patient to the procedure because it is very nicely 
done and projected by Mahesh as usual. So, yeah. what is the actually should we explain to the patient that probably you may not get a, a, a normal ankle? Yeah, so that may be the question of many many listeners. That what could be the first counselling to such patients when the outcomes are very variable? So let me ask Vinod sir. Sir, how do you counsel your patients when you see it on day one? Definitely, you see. I mean, you, that's a great point. And every every surgeon, you know, young folks who are starting up should have a good talk with the patient. Otherwise, the patients will be disappointed. You need to paint. You need to paint the entire scenario. See, I mean, obviously, this can end up in amputation too. You know. I set out saying that it might need multiple stages of surgery. You know, each stage you have to pass and then we can go into the next stage. If the first stage is successful, you go to the next stage, the third stage. It might be that you're very lucky and that's only 10% or 5% of patients who are very lucky, everything goes normal and you have only one operation. More often than not, you will end up with second and third operation. And the second and third operation depends on the outcome on the first operation. And it could be you will end up in fusion. You know, um, this is a technically very challenging case, and you know, the person who has fixed it, yes, yeah. Mahesh Shoni, is a very yeah. excellent surgeon. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. So, thank you, Doctor Sony. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sony, sir, wanted to know. Yeah. yeah, sir, how do you handle this deltoid ligament injury? Primary deltoid repair. Would you like to repair deltoid primarily in this case? Yes. How will you fix it? I would do that because you see, the more stability you provide to the soft tissue healing is much better. You know, I, so you will use anchors or something. Uh, how, how do you I fix it? I hesitate in putting a suture anchor there and 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 uh, and, and bringing the tailors. You see, I don't want the okay. instability there. You see, so yeah, there's I'll instability, to, medial lateral instability. Yeah. You know, that puts kind of a strain to the soft tissue, and then it will drift. You see, I mean, you know, it it is a severe abduction injury, so. It has an inherent tendency to drift. See? So, I, I want to stress this point. You see, contouring the plate is very important. Now, all the industry folks will say, you know, oh, I got the best uh, fibular plate, anatomic fibular plate. We we done 800 cadaver dissections. We looked at CT scans and we got this plate which matches, you know, 99% of the fibula. I said, that is, is nonsense. I do not want the fibular plate to match the fibula. I want to use contour to help my reduction, help my stability. So I kind of under contour or make the plate, I, you know, I, I, I totally take away the bend. You know, the striker guys, Cynthia's guys, they, they, they boast about the anatomic fibular plate. My, my, our plate is the best, most contoured fibular plate in 19. That's nonsense, totally nonsense. Actually, if, you, if it is contoured and you put the screws, it has a bend, it will drift, it will drag that distal fibula out. Even if you put a locking screws, it will completely uh, mess up. I don't like that. So I can under contour. I put little, uh, lower down the syndesmotic screws. It will push it uh, nicely, the fibula into the thing and provide a great lateral stability. So, so good case. Case. do you prefer some? Yeah. Yeah. So good for simple. Case. Manoj sir, can we proceed because we are running Girish? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so it's your turn, Girish. Uh, so, uh, now I ask Dr. Girish Motwani to start his presentation and uh, he will be showing us a case of uh, Sanders type 3 calcaneum fracture and uh, he will be also giving us a clinical profile as to what will be the problems uh, with a very bad soft tissue if you have on the first day. Yeah. Uh, Vinod sir, uh, can we can I proceed to calcaneum or you have to cover the teller area? Um, I don't know how much how much time do we have right now. Um, okay. you, I have a case ankle arthrosis uh, arthroscopic, so it should take me another half an hour to. It's not yet on the table. All right. So, so you want me to start the calcaneum or? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, I mean, we have another hour, right? At least. Yeah. Yes, sir. Then, yeah. Or, uh, if, if we can finish uh, the, the the source lecture if sir would be busy later on. Uh, what if do you say, Girish? Yeah, if you have a time, sir, we can have a uh, Taylor avian because it is a continuation of the Taylor. Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can load up. Uh, where's my guy um, Let me see if I can share my screen. Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, let me. Sorry. This is an Apple computer. I don't use it, you know, my... Somebody got it. There you go, it's opening up. Girish, by that time, can I ask one question? 
Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In, the, in the previous case, uh, uh, in the uh, first instance, use of a vac would enhance the tissue healing. Uh, I mean, the thing is, you don't know how infected tissue that you lack. Oh, My point is, we we are just more of doing thorough debridement. You can okay. put a vac. Vac can be a good dressing instead of any other dressing. And when you are taking in 48 hours, see that what else, immediate plastic coverage, or you can close it or put the mood vac on it. Yeah. Okay. So, and sir, what is your yeah. otherwise in the use of the vac in foot and ankle? Yeah, I find uh, in such injuries, tremendous benefit in the okay. sense, in the sense, the edema drastically drops down the the whole okay. edematous tissue after a compound injury that that is taken away. even even the use of a surface vac also helps is what my experience is especially after a complete debris mark. of course not 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 without a complete debris. so you're here it's loaded up yeah yep i, I agree surface vac we use for number of times for total ankle as well as peel on fixation and stuff sure. okay. if you have good opportunity if you have ability you should use it for sure. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Intro. Yeah, that's great. Okay, here we are. So, uh, share screen. I'll zoom both up to zoom. Uh -huh. uh, Girish, by, uh, can I ask another question? Any yes, sir. Any, part any particular way a deltoid ligament needs repair with the... Mm -hmm. I think uh, the slide is loaded up now. Everything All right, and so... The presentation. Yeah. yeah, Ashish, sir. Yes. Yeah, any part, I mean, the, you keep the anatomical alignment. That's number one. Yeah. Number two, you use the suture anchor for the reconstruction. Okay. Right. You clean up the gutter, make sure. And if there is no delta left, a uh, number of times, like, you know, I use the tissue. I mean, I have the, we have the allograph, or I take the sleeve of the peroneal tendon and do the reconstruction with that as well. Okay, let's go with the AV and tell us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, thank you again. You know, appreciate mm -hmm. the team for providing me the opportunity to talk. Uh, apologize for being in and out of the OR. And, but what I'm going to do is uh, talk about the situations wherein, uh, you know, the talus is completely uh, necrotic and collapsed. So how, how do you manage uh, that situation at that stage? Um, and uh, let me see. So one thing I want to say straight off the bat, if you do not do it right, there are potential problems, you see. So, you know, for here, for example, you can see, um, let me just, uh, uh, what do you see here? You see, so the foot is very plantar flexed and subluxed forwards. You see. So that's, uh, you know, we need to pay attention to how, I'm going to be talking about hind foot fusion because you see, when we have a tailor body necrosis, then you are dealing with two joints. This is ankle joint and septalar joint. And, and the best scenario to salvage this situation is often a hind foot uh, fusion nail or hind foot arthrodesis. But for that, you see, positioning is absolutely critical. So I want to show you know what happens if you don't get the position right. So here it is dorsiflexed and 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 sublux forwards. You see, because you know you have problems up and down the chain, you do not get it right. So that's very critical. Um, you know, see, this is what's happening. You see, if you have a plantar flex a foot, the heel doesn't touch the floor, you know, and, and this guy lives in Texas, wears uh, cowboy boots to get around that problem. Um, you know, these are kind of, I think there's a snake, right? Is this a snake, cowboy boots? Oh, so, yeah. But you can see how, <laughs> how, you know, how it is raised, but, but he's managing, but you know, but if he's not wearing shoes, then he's a problem. Now here, the problem is that he's in varus, you know, and for that, He's wearing all that, um, you know, double upright brace, and you can see he's overloading the lateral border of the foot. So, you know, hind foot fusion is great if when it is right, if when it's done right. But if you do not do it right, they are permanently uh, having some problems like this. You see, so depending on a special shoes or orthotics, and even then they continue to get callus. You see, and, and their blocking is difficult and, and painful. So I'm going to show you some technical aspects of how I do these things. You can certainly use uh, different uh, positioning 
uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, um, uh, on the table. This is a lateral positioning. You need to have kind of a platform. You can use a bone form or whatever, but you need to make sure that you, uh, you put the position in such a way that you will not only get a good lateral, but also, uh, this is a laser beam, you see, but also a good alignment in the tibio calcaneal view, align, uh, view. See, it's very, very critical. I think Dr. Shah mentioned, you know, where you start the nail, uh, you know, in the calcaneus is very important. Uh, you can see, you should be able to see this kind of projection. That's the tibia, that's the calcaneus. You can see that the entry point is not in the middle. You know, I, I have done this mistake myself. So, you know, so you have to be careful. You have to, you have to find that if you are doing a mistake, you need to remove that guide wire and then place it not in the medial wall, but also the posterior aspect of the, of the uh, calcaneus. We're very critical to do that. So here you see, um, you can see the foot is way forwardly subluxed. It's not lined up with the tibia, which is a very bad scenario for the patient, you see. So they're putting ex excessive amount of stresses in the show parts joint. And then in 10 years down the line, they will come up with arthritis there in the, uh, in the sopar joint, you can see the arthritis there in the subtalar joint because uh, the, the ankle arthritis position is not ideal. So it's setting stage for future problems, you see. So, uh, you know, if you look at the alignment of the tibia versus the hind foot, uh, you get a long lever arm if you anteriorly sublux the foot. I want to emphasize this uh, time and again, you see. So it's like walking with your skis on, this is my family. So instead of doing that, you should actually consciously sublux the foot uh, posteriorly that way you know you can uh, shorten the liver arm you can uh, you know biomechanically you're not putting uh, too much stress on the midfoot and the show part joint as well uh, but the problem that comes with that you see your 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 nail is way anterior but you know we'll come around i'll come to that later on um, <clears throat> but but biomechanically is much better uh, scenario you see i mean uh, in fact if you do it well and you have a patient after arthrodesis and you observe the gait, it's actually difficult to know which side is fused and they walk very normally, as you can see in this particular patient with a fusion. Um, and you know, you can see the wasting because uh, that side is fused. Uh, and, and this particular patient had a necrotic uh, Taylor uh, body, but uh, this was because of a tumor and this was a cement, you see, and she went on uh, to have this for a long time. But you see in Taylor avian, the neck and the head is always vascular, is always vascular. So you can make use of that, you see. So when you sublex the foot back, you get that uh, healthy distal tibia to unite with the vascular anterior aspect of the head and neck. So not never ever I've seen a scenario wherein the entire tail is necrotic. There's always a head and neck, which is, still living, still has blood supply. The body, yeah, body can die, but but the head and neck are surviving. So you see this particular patient had this particular fusion. It's anteriorly subluxed. I'm sorry, uh, the, the foot is posteriorly subluxed and in better alignment, you see. Now you see this extra screw, we sometimes need to put that to kind of provide extra stability, you see, because the nail is starting off with a very narrow anterior lateral aspect of the distal tip uh, um, of the calcaneus, you see. So, but, you know, um, you need to, the other point I want to talk about is um, the entry point, you see. So after you make the skin incision, you need to really remove all the neurovascular structures from the side. If you don't protect the neurovascular structures, you might, you know, in, end up damaging that. So that's your friend. I, I mentioned about the tibial calcaneal down on, on the lateral projection. It looks that you you place the distal distal aspect of the tibia, uh, the nail in the in a better aspect of the uh, of the of the calcaneus. But if you look at the axial projection, no, it's not. It's actually in the medial wall. It's not going into the better part of the calcaneus. You see, so uh, it is it's violating the medial part. Uh, medial wall of the calcaneus. If you look at just a lateral, it looks great. But if you look at the axial view, that's why it's very important to get the uh, tibio calcaneal alignment view because it's a three-dimensional structure. Uh, you know, as you can see, the calcaneus is very narrow anteriorly and it's mostly lateral, not medial. So you have to understand the positioning of the hind foot when you're shooting that nail up in the hind foot. Very technically, very important. So you don't want to do this. And sometimes this, this uh, nail with a bent, you see, allow you to uh, do that. You can see how 
how did how we can uh, in, in place the uh, the nail through the more lateral tissue. We did a study here a long time ago. We showed you know how the the straight nails fit in the calcaneus versus the curved nail. Anyway, I'm going to also talk about two important concepts. You see, sometimes we need a medial malleolar osteotomy to reduce the liver arm, and also need the additional stability, which I which I mentioned a uh, while ago about the screw. So if you don't provide enough stability, this is another scenario wherein the uh, TLR body is disappeared because of uh, trauma. We can see um, that the, the, the head and neck, part of the neck of the talus is still vascular, but you see there's no stability. So there you have a capital clapper in a bell scenario wherein the distal aspect of the nail is eating away the bone in the, in the, in the calcaneus and you know, there is no union in the, in the hind product. So this is, you can see. Therefore, you really need sometimes um, additional stability there, you know, additional screws, uh, miss a nail screws, so on and so forth. I'm going to uh, show a case, you know, wherein again you see the scenario with a total avascular necrosis of talus called co collapse. Now, you know, some people might do a total TLR, this is a trend there, but you know, I think the evidence is not yet there long term, so I'm not a fan of it right now. But you know, if if you want one operation and done for the particular patient, and especially in an Indian scenario, you want success, you want a good union there, uh, you can make use of this uh, anterior, uh, anterior part of the talus, you know, the, the head and neck of the talus, which is vascular and, and correct uh, and get a good union there, you see. So, you know, how do you reduce the anterior subluxation? You can actually cut the deltoid and other soft tissues and push the foot back. You need to get length and then push the foot back, you see, because I told you, if you fuse in this scenario, just a tibia and calcaneus wave with the foot very anteriorly subplex, you, you don't have a good biomechanical gait, you see, you don't, the gait doesn't look very normal, as I showed you in the video before. Very important to position the foot uh, in the way it should be, you see, so this is the particular patient which we, talk, we, which we have there, you know, I use, instead of releasing the deltoid ligament, I do an osteotomy of the, of the, uh, of the, of the malleolus, that way I can push the foot back, you know, so uh, that's the sound effect, medial malleolar osteotomy, and then, you know, um, uh, and do the same thing on the lateral side. Now you can move the foot back, way back, you see. So, you know, I'll do that both sides. Um, and then you can position, and you can, like I said, you, you need to make sure that you get that entry point really right uh, aligned, you see, and then you, you put your rod, and then you, you put the fusion, and then you can see, you know, I think it helps the uh, helps the union as union rates too. You see, so this particular scenario, you salvaged it. Uh, this is the only operation he, he he will need forever. You know, so I think what I want to do is end up with these important things. You know, positioning of the arthritis is very important. I hope at least I sold this particular important point to the folks listening. Uh, you can, can certainly add uh, osteotomy to help you uh, get that alignment and uh, you know get that good uh, view to make sure that you have a good purchase in the calcaneus. Uh, I want to end with this uh, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions at this stage and I will jump in and out uh, uh, of the, um, um, how do I get this? Uh, Thank you Vinod sir, great presentation as always. We have heard you in the IFAS and the other webinars. Um, sir, few quick questions. Uh, uh, so let's start with the, how do you, uh, how do you manage when you, so if, so if you are seeing a post-traumatic Tyler AVA, uh, how do you uh, categorize for uh, such patients in, uh, for the conservative, for the, for the, uh, for the fusion or for the poor decompression, if it is a third option for you, how do you categorize and how do you judge where you have to go? What are your criteria of fusion? Thank you, Girish. You know, I just jumped straight into the, the worst kind of scenarios with the uh, avascular necrosis. You know, obviously, we do not. We want to, you know, um, certainly offer conservative management options to our patients. Um, you know, we start off with, uh, you know, I tell my patients, you know, the reason they are getting the pain is because part of the ankle and part of the hind foot is arthritic or, uh, you know, a pain generating um, joint, or uh, there is distortion there. So. You know, there's a spectrum. Sometimes the vascular necrosis is totally uh, as 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 advanced and as severe as you've seen in those examples, but sometimes not. Um, so certainly, uh, orthotics. Uh, you know, you can get the over-the-counter orthotics like ankle support. I tell them, you know, you need to have something around the ankle, like you 
like this english folks used to wear a tight corset around the waist a corset around the waist so you can have a tight ankle support around the hind foot and that way um, you can um, you can you can you, you can uh, um, you talk to me do you have a minute yeah uh, just one moment one moment Uh, can I? Uh, um, yes, yeah, I, I. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just uh, come back in a few seconds, okay? Sure. Okay. Can okay. you okay. stop sharing, Sahir? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I mean, that's a great talk, and this is very good. Uh, you know, uh, this is the procedure that you guys will be doing very often in India, the TTC fusion, right? So a couple of things, the avian of the talus, the core after failure of the conservative management, core decompression is more successful for the avian of the talus without post-traumatic, basically with the steroid use or rheumatoid or lupus, that is where core decompression is more successful than the post-traumatic, okay? I mean, that's proven in literature. But again, if the post-traumatic comes with AVN, as long as the patient understands, you know, and they're okay with that, then perform. That's one thing, okay? Uh, number two, conservative. Here, you cannot win this battle. I know, I mean, it cannot be successful fusion for in the one stretch for this patient, okay? When you are doing this, for the avian of the talus. So, and number of times there are so much deform. So when I do the surgery here, I, I start with the percutaneous tendoculus langmi. So basically when I do perc TAL, I'm just getting rid of the liver arm. And so I can reduce the talus, whatever the fragment, okay? Then I come laterally, I do the fibular osteotomy so I can have access to the talus or calcaneus. If there was already anti approach used in the past or any other approaches, I use that approach. Number three, if there is a real varus deformity or valgus deformity, I cut down my peronia from the side. So I can do medial lateral movement with the talus dislocation. I mean, I can reposition. Then medial malleolar osteotomy or posterior tibial tendon, cutting the posterior tibial tendon. That's either of them or both of them very helpful for bringing the talus back underneath the calcaneus or underneath in the ankle joint as well, okay? So that's very important. Other thing, there is a one thing which I do very often. It's a poor man's TTC or poor surgeon's TTC fusion nail. I use fibula as a nail. I mean, we have published, I mean, uh, we have published on that, like in my patients with the history of infections in the past, previous non-unions, AVNs, poor bone loss or uh, like, you know, lack of the bone there and with the failed surgeries. I use more of like, you know, up to 12 size reamer all the way down to the, from calcaneus, tibia and talus. And I shovel the fibula as a nail. And you'll be amazed. Number of times in the past, I said like, hey, we will do the fibula as a nail and we'll put the ring fixator. But this with the fibula, it was such a solid fixation. My residents say, hey, Shah, why don't we just skip the ring fixator because it's very painful, right? So what I do, like, you know, if there is no history of infection, I do number of cross screws, just like the ankle fusion screws, but you can extend up to the calcaneus. And Lou Sean has said that screws from the calcaneus, talus to tibia, you know, you can do the cross screws, like, you know, from calcaneus, talus to tibia, you can add those screws on top of there for fixation. What you can do if you are doing this avian talus, if you're not using fibula as a strut graph or nail, you take the fibula at the level of syndesmosis and chop it on the side of the table with the ronger or saw blade, use as a good autograph and you pack it at the fusion side. You take the, you take the graph from medially, you pack it at the fusion side and like, you know, that can be also useful here. So, and I have some patients who tell us body was completely gone and really destroy, I use them and I want them not to come back to see me. I do TBO calcaneal fusion, okay? So what do I do? I do remove the body at the level of neck, okay? I shave off the anterior part of the lower end of the tibia. 
So you are making fusion of the lower end of tibia, incorporating with the tailor neck, okay? And you are making fusion between tibia and calcaneus. So it's very important now you are making solid stability of the transverse tarsal joint as well as the fusion side. So, so that can be helpful, with the, but again, it will make shortening for the patient as long as the patient understands and you don't want to do multiple surgeries. And the last take home message, total tailor replacement, tailor allograph replacement, it looks fancy and sexy in the book or in the video. You don't want painful patient to follow you and ruin your reputation in the society. And it's very expensive as well. May I ask one yes, question, sir. Ashish, sir? I have one, sir. Whether you do the surgery in, um, whether you do the surgery in tourniquet, because you so much manipulation and there are term, you are dealing with the terminal neurovascular bundles. So is it possible that while doing a manipulation under tourniquet, it is possible to injure the vascular structure because you are stretching too much medially, laterally, posteriorly, anteriorly? In a TTG I mean, that, 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 see that. You, 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 that's a very good question. See, that's the reason I mobilize the ankle and subtalar, first of all, by removing the Achilles, okay? Because you don't need Achilles tendon after TTC fusion, okay? So I park the TAL, so Achilles, so basically, I want to take the tension off from my neurovasculatures, okay? So I park the TAL, take the Achilles out, take the peroneal out, and when you remove the medial malleolar osteotomy or taking the medial malleolus at the level of the ankle joint and taking the fibula at the level of syndesmosis, it is such an amazing power of manipulating and bringing the thing together without damaging the neurovasculatures. Yeah, Nitin sir. Yeah. One question, does this TTC fusions are different from uh, what we do in diabetic fusions? Like uh, Tyler, avian as well as diabetic fusions are different? Or we do more augmentation in diabetics or something like that? Yeah, so it's it's pretty much similar. The principle of fixations are similar. The position, like you know, neutral position, five to ten degree valgus, it's all similar. The diabetes patient, you do the multiple point and more fixation, right? Yeah. Or you you keep them non-weight bearing or protected weight bearing for up to three months and follow with the pro walker or a for something, right? Whereas these people, most probably, they are more of the younger population. So they heal faster. But AVN, if, if you are not seeing good healing across the ankle fusion side, subtalar side because of the AVN, you need to keep this patient protected with a boot or walking cast or something until you get the fusion across. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a wonderful uh, discussion on this uh, Talus AVN. Uh, so can we move ahead with this uh, calcaneus case of uh, Dr. Girish? So I now invite Dr. Girish to start sharing his screen and uh, uh, share his presentation on calcaneum fracture. Yes, sir. Am I audible, visible? I have shared the screen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ashish, sir. Uh, Vinod, sir, for the uh, great yeah. discussion on the Talus. And uh, now we are moving little down below the talus and now we are on the calcaneum. So my job in next 10 minutes will be to describe a case, a complicated case of center type three with a poor soft tissue. And, uh, and my, my basic theme is to deal the problems in presence of the poor soft tissue status. So we know all the burning issues in the calcaneal fracture. This is a very common fracture in the, uh, in the uh, foot. Calcaneum is a very common and it is always a, a great challenge uh, when you are operating a complicated sanders type 3 or 4 uh, particularly with the minimal invasive pain in, in presence of the poor soft tissue and uh, uh, we are all aware that the lateral extensile approach has been com very commonly used since many years but there are some restrictions to this approach you cannot use a lateral extensile approach as a as a basic for all the cases because it is up to 40% wound complications has been reported in the many text journals, uh, the uh, studies. And uh, also it is not suitable when your case is a chronic smoker or uncontrolled diabetes or in presence of a poor collateral circulations or when you have waited for the long time 
14 days 15 days 20 days and still the soft tissue swelling is bad so sometimes you have to surrender uh, the lateral extensile approach and uh, there are many percutaneous approach which have which have been mentioned and the people are doing it very regularly but many time it is just a play particularly in presence of a, a, a depressed fragment and uh, radiology they actually misguide us regarding the actual elevation of the fragment in presence of the uh, true depression type so percutaneous techniques are good for the tongue type but not for the uh, for the depression type and there are many complications we are all knowing varus valgus subtalar arthritis loss of the calcul width and the height so my case uh, so so this all leads to the dysfunctional foot so i will describe a, a minimal invasive sinus tarsi approach in my case which look like a balance between a open extensile and the percutaneous fixation and uh, here everything you see uh, in front of your eyes is a small surgical window and you can manipulate and get a optimal uh, results so here is a case of 30 year old male he is a civil contractor he fell down from the uh, from the height of almost uh, 25 ft and this was the presenting x ray so let me ask uh, chandak sir sir are you yeah. there yeah yeah so, so let me ask like how uh, you see uh, uh, such kind of injuries when they present immediately after uh, fall from height yeah so first two or three days goes away in managing the swelling and intense pain which they have so mm-hmm. i just put them into observation elevation ice therapy and uh, uh, appropriate edema reduction measures i would put uh, a watch on uh, neurovascular if they have any other injury etc and uh, counsel them for a surgical procedure say around 10 days to 12 days down the line once the wrinkle sign is there that okay. is what my initial protocol would be okay so one is you you nicely managed that nicely mentioned that a uh, soft tissue status is very important okay. and this yes. will di- dictate you about the time of surgery yes. uh lokande sir yes sir yeah sir uh, any other thing from the soft tissue which you see on day one or how do you see such injury in a young patient is a need of surgery always mandatory Yes, definitely. In such uh, depressed fragments, where one part of the subtalar joint is not there in its position, it is important to bring it back there. But uh, uh, we uh, in India still we are uh, lagging behind the other surgeons in the world in managing these soft tissues. We just immobilize and elevate it and let the soft tissues heal over the period of time. But there are centers which still apply. You will find the external center on day one to correct all the parameters like height and width. In that first part, they keep it reduced and let the swelling subside. So we monitor it over the period of time, but currently we just believe in immobilization and elevation. Again, so so again, you want to wait till you get a good resolution of the soft tissue edema and. and then you have to intervene uh, may i ask dr abhishek jain am i audible sir abhishek uh, okay uh, mahesh yeah, sir i am audible audible yeah yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, abhishek how do you see the need of ct scan such injuries ct Or scan we directly proceed to the uh, surgery ct scan is mandatory for any operative intervention even if you do mis or lateral extensile approach because unless and until we do a ct scan we cannot have a holistic picture in the axial coronal and sagittal plane and you might encounter surprises in ot if you don't do ct scan uh, abhishek what what do you see like uh, uh, what else you see apart from the plain x ray in the ct scan which changes your management interoperative fine so in ct scan we see three planes one is sagittal plane where we see where is the depression is it more on the lateral side more on the medial side is it a tongue type or is it a joint depression so this is very much elucidated in the coronal plane you also see uh, whether there is a varus or valgus so, yeah and in the um, uh, sorry in the axial plane and in the coronal plane we actually see the subtalar joint and we see how many cracks are there 
starting okay. from the subtalar joint into the calcaneum and thus we classify it into standards and plan our approach yeah. suppose if it's standards 2 then definitely mis can be thought of if it is standards 3 and 4 then we are away from mis we are more towards lateral extension side right so uh, abhishek i have uh, gone through your advice and sir these are just the you know, radiological markers so here the polar angle is actually negative normal is 20 to 40 degree but it is negative minus 25 you can see the alignment of the heel is almost in the varus there is a significant lateral wall doubt there is a significant subfibular impingement Uh, you can see the shortening of the calcaneal height and the broadening of the calcaneal width so these are all my indication in the young patients of doing a surgery because i wanted to avoid a calcaneal malunion in the bad position but this was a very disappointing thing for me when i was planning for the surgery but as the chancellor has nicely mentioned that you have to wait in such kind of foot injuries at least for the 10 to 14 days till you get a good resolution of the soft tissue and uh, then you can proceed for the surgery so i have waited for the 10 days and after 10 days still there was a big blister uh, on on the lateral side over the over my lateral approach incision and uh, because of too much of the displacement i think the soft tissue resolution was not good uh, in spite of having a strict protocol of elevation enzymes and uh, elastocrep application and all so this was a day 10 so i have gone through uh, the advice of uh, dr abhishek jain he told me to go for ct scan which tell you about the actual depression of the fracture that you can see it is almost completely inside the substance of the calcaneum so this is my posterior fracture and this is the sanders uh, classification which you can do only on the ct scan on the corner which give you the idea about how many fracture i have to deal if i am going for the mis technique and definitely a lateral wall blowout which tell me no you have to keep the plate ready you have to keep the screw ready and maybe your fully threaded screw will be more helpful when you have to span as like diminution so these are some important dd city you can see look at the uncoverage of the talus this gives an idea about the bad talus depression look at the subfibular space these are the space where the peroneal tendons they lie and it is very small so if you conserve it they may come to you with the bad peroneal tenosynovitis and the varus and the comminution at the level of uh, subtalar joint so uh, the next thing how do you plan when you have a, a a bad soft tissue in spite of waiting for 10 days 11 days and such kind of injury may i ask ashish sir sir how do you see on day 10 such kind of injury bad soft tissue ashish sir so let let me tell i mean this is where you guys see this fracture lot more than any other places i mean being at the level 1 institute we like my partner and i collectively we do like 4 to 6 calcaneus a week okay so one thing that we have learned if this patient comes with the, this type of skin condition the only thing which i will change here i will go ahead and put the external fixator on this patient okay you you must be thinking this guy is crazy you know but you you might have noticed when the community type of calcaneus fracture when you are operating within a day or within either you operate within 24 hours or you have to operate after 2 weeks when the swelling and wrinkle sign there right so you might have noticed when you operate within 24 hours it's like you know it's like a butter you know you can move the pieces so easily you get the perfect reduction and when you take it after 2 weeks it's painful okay so one thing what i do here for this patients is i put them in the delta frame like time and pain i mean the pain going from the calcaneus i get the length height varus vagus like you know alignment if necessary i add the gastric resection for this patient and i do this some joystick maneuver if possible with the k wire <coughs> to maintain the pitch height and the length okay so that's one thing but now if this patient came to see me let's say 12 weeks i mean 12 days or 14 days right and if the skin condition permissible at the time 
Now I've changed everything to more of the sinus tarsi approach. But if you're not done a couple of dozen calcaneus fractures, you should not do that. Do the regular approach. And the way we, we mentioned, like, you know, that keep the picture of the opposite side on your CR or keep the sawbone calcaneus in the plastic bag. So you can keep on formatting that, you know, and whatever the Girish mentioned the principles, that's very important you mentioned this. But here, I, I do the osteotomy, lifting up the posterior facet here, you know. So that's a very important, like Romesh osteotomy, like you might have noticed, you might have seen. So I keep the machine under the axial view or Salzman view. And like, you know, I put the osteotum through this underneath the fragment and lift it up and do the varus valgus alignment here. Correction of the varus valgus alignment. Am I answering your questions or I, I did not understand that? So I might have learned 100 calculin fracture from you under your fellowship, but every time when you discuss, you get some good ideas and uh, thank you. it gets more clear. Thank you. I appreciate it, sir. So, uh, so uh, in my case, uh, when I had option to go for the one surgery, we were not very trained in uh, putting an external fixator on the calcaneal fracture. So I <clears throat> decided to go for the sinus tarsi approach because my soft tissue were not favorable. So this was the thing. Uh, these are this is a small incision started from the base of the uh, fibula going to the base of the fifth fourth metatarsal. Sorry. And you have to compromise the calcaneofibular ligament. The moment you cut the capsule, you see the joint directly. And these are the some manipulative things which I have done. One, one wire to control the tuberosity virus. Uh, this impaction of uh, the medial sustentacular piece like this, putting a small osteotome or uh, a per uh, I mean the uh, periosteal retractor, periosteal elevator. And a very important instrument, Hinterman retractor uh, and uh, uh, the lamina spreader, which are very important for the joint elevation, as you can see here. Without wasting the time, let me show the importance of the lamina spreader. Uh, you can see here, the, there is a big step on the posterior facet. And bus, but if you put on the sub the lamina spreader on the sub-articular uh, plane, you can get a good uh, elevation of the joint and the moment you get a good elevation of the joint surface, you can put the additional wires and you can transfix temporarily to the talus also uh, to maintain your temporary alignment. When you are satisfied with the reconstruction of the bowler angle, basin angle, we can put a small plate to control the lateral ball blowout and uh, to control the axial alignment, a 1cc screw. Uh, uh, and this is how I completed a case with a one uh, CC screw under the posterior facet as well. And this is how the plate was appearing, sub-peroneal uh, plating. And uh, this is my uh, soft tissue closure. So in spite of having a lot of potential uh, bleeding inside the soft tissue after enough weight, uh, still uh, we would have uh, achieve a good soft tissue healing and a good radiological realignment of uh, the depressed uh, parameters. So here you can see the Giesen angle, calcaneal height, width, uh, and uh, they are all under the good uh, reconstruction. Uh, so this is a soft tissue healing, which is uh, very satisfactory. You can go for the early, uh, I mean, uh, mobilization of the patient as well after the good a fixation of all the components of the injury. And this is like my ongoing research, which is still not published of 110 patients, including 118 feet. And uh, through this study, I'm comparing the, actually the radiological restoration of the height width and the angle of descent. And we have found 93.3% good functional outcome as well, uh, except for some complication of superficial infection in two cases and uh, some implant prominences and a uh, complex regional pain syndrome in one case. Uh, in, in comparison to the other study which is published, this study is having a large number of patients. All surgery are done by a single surgeon and we are involving only type 2 and type 3 centers. And it's a prospective study. Uh, this is my conclusion, having a good satisfactory radiological and the functional outcome. Of course, our study has some limitation. It is not randomized. It didn't have a control group so that we can have a comparison. And the follow-up is short, but still many patients are in uh, the good recovery. Thank you for your kind attention. It is wonderful presentation as usual. And actually this uh, 
subtalar uh, approach has given actually revolutionized the treatment of the calcaneal fracture because the extensile approach was so much extensive and it giving a soft tissue problems necrosis was the rule and with this approach actually we were able to uh, treat all types of calcaneal fractures uh, with minimum incision but i would respect uh, dr ashish uh, he has very nicely uh, concluded in the last that you have experience of at least 25 to 30 lateral extensile approach before you can move to the sinus tarsal because it's a expert approach everything you are doing through the minimal invasion and it is not a alternative uh, to the lateral extensile all the time but yes in presence of the bad soft tissue specific indications like peripheral vascular disease uncontrolled diabetes and a poor soft tissue uh, status after long wait i think sinus tarsal is good yep now that, that's a great presentation girish uh, i i totally agree with you and one thing what you can do when you start doing the sinus tarsi approach you don't need to keep the mini open you can keep the longer in the sinus tarsi just yeah. like a earlier earlier's approach you know right see right. see everything in front of your eyes okay if there is a lateral wall comminution you can lift it up with your cob elevator laterally from the same incision okay so it's very important that like you know that you start with the longer don't put the stress on the skin and and do the grid fixation and when you start correcting this uh, deformity as girish mentioned you should put the smooth pins from calcaneus to talus okay and crossing the joint when you are manipulating for the correction i mean manipulating for taking the x-rays and what girish has taken the x-ray axial view which is more like a salzman view you you are focusing on the forefoot so you can get the tibia talus and calcaneus in alignment not only focusing on calcaneus because now you are cheating yourself doing varus or valgus depending upon how you like it you know i think it's a very important take home message you have to yeah, yeah. keep on the charles pen view not on the yeah. harry sex view well may i come yeah yes manoj sir yeah, yeah. so yeah. initial initial manipulation of day 1 of the calcaneus fracture manual manipulation holding the uh, heel with both hands and uh, getting the pieces uh -huh. yes, so manual manipulation will help in reducing the edema i am following uh -huh. this on the day one i will just manipulate the tuberosity and all the fragments will get in place that will really help in reducing the edema right. yeah i mean i mean that's yeah. good good point to learn i mean but you know mahesh these patients are in so much pain right with the calcaneus fracture it may be a challenge i put it in this way if you know that this patient is not going to go for surgery let i let's see if the patient comes within next within 6 hours and it's a day time so i would rather do the surgery right away 6 to 12 hours with the sinus tarsal approach you can move all fragments so easily but let's say if the patient comes in the night if it's more than 24 hours then you know that now the swelling started developing blister started developing try out external fixer try out you know one time you'll be so amazed with the external fixer that takes 5 minutes you know to put it on and manipulation with some kvar stabilizing stuff your next surgery will be so easy to do it you know from the sinus tarsal approach but would definitely love to learn your outcomes like you know on 20 30 patients hey you are doing some manipulation and sedation and it's helping to bring the swelling down for sure new local hematoma yeah. blood sinus tarsal okay and would love to learn yeah. more you know so if you can take some uh, pictures and like you know some outcome that be great it's good learning for everybody yeah yeah gerish that's a excellent presentation as usual it's a wonderful case uh, which uh, took out many points so now i invite our uh, next uh, presenter dr abhishek jain from new delhi and uh, he will be presenting a case of a neglected malunating calcaneum fracture uh am i audible everyone yes, yes. yeah thank you uh, ortho tv and dr girish for having me here i'm just sharing my screen
is my screen audible uh, visible yes abhishek go ahead yes, yeah. yeah hi so uh, my presentation is pertaining to the fact what happened when that calcaneal fracture came to girish and he was in a vacation in goa so the patient later turned out to me that okay dr girish was not there so after 6 months what is going to happen so that is where this presentation comes in so my patient is a 60 years old lady who had a fall from height 7 months back sustained left calcaneal fracture she was treated with cast now she presents with pain on lateral aspect of hind foot on walking with intermittent swelling now in this was a very simple and straight forward case but i would just like to take a tour of how do i think and what do i think when i see a calcaneal malunion so heel pain with history of calcaneal fracture my workup would include where is the pain when is the pain can the patient squat is it any... sorry sorry for interrupting you can yeah. you make a full screen uh, is it it is a oh sorry i'm sorry yeah sorry yeah it's okay now yes yes sir yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so when is the pain can the patient squat is there any tingling numbness or burning my x ray workup would include a weight bearing foot lateral view and a hind foot alignment view and definitely a ankle ap view ct scan may not be always required for me now what i am concerned with in a calcaneal malunion the first thing which is very obvious is a subtalar arthritis second any varus or valgus deformity a residual deformity third a lateral wall or a plantar exostosis fourth a loss of talar declination or a loss of calcaneal height which doesn't allow a full dorsiflexion of ankle any nerve entrapment on the medial side or any chronic peroneal subluxation which is quite common in sanders 3 or a peroneal entrapment a subfibular entrapment when there is a uh, lateral wall blow out in this patient my examination findings were there was no coronal plane deformity there was no varus valgus it was a as i told it was a straight forward case as inspected from back there was subfibular tenderness subtalar range of motion was minimal and that too was with pain she was able to squat and she generally when there is a calcaneal uh, malunion the subtalar arthritis the pain occurs when the patient walks on uneven terrain but this patient had pain whenever she used to walk mostly on the lateral side now this was the x ray so my x ray findings were like definitely there was a loss of gisen and bohler angle the talus was more horizontal which meant that the calcaneal calcaneum has lost its height and the declination angle of cal talus was lost and the talus was more dorsiflexed in its attitude in the salzman view we could see there is a bump on the lateral wall which could be the cause of peroneal uh, which could be the cause of subfibular tenderness but having had a look at this x ray one thing was very difficult to digest that the patient was able to squat without any problem so my diagnosis was it was a calcaneal malunion with a subtalar arthritis lateral wall exostosis and a subfibular impingement and as per the classification by ramelt and zwick of calcaneal malunion it had fallen into type 1 now this was my plan a lateral wall exostectomy and subfibular decompression and a simple subtalar fusion without making any varus or valgus arrangement now this was my plan what would have been my plan if the ankle dorsiflexion was restricted then i would have to increase the talar declination using a 
distraction arthrodesis like this and putting a perhaps a tricortical iliac crest graft in the back of the subtalar joint well i didn't do this one because the ankle dorsiflexion was apt for a good spot so my surgery was very straightforward and simple my the positioning was lateral decubitus incision was lateral extensile you can see that there is quite a bump over the uh, lateral wall of the calcaneum what i did was a subfibular decompression and how do i do it i pass a k wire on the lateral wall of the calcaneus such that it should match with the medial border of fibula and that is a i'm very sorry for a bad picture which is not descriptive enough uh, a k wire on the lateral wall of the calcaneum such that this k wire matches with the medial border of fibula now this is the junk this is the junk that has to be removed so this would decompress the subfibular part you do a cartilage uh, denudation prepare a subtalar joint and then i fix it with a 6.5 cc screw in situ and this was my last picture thank you yeah good case abhishek uh ashish sir how would have you have managed uh can you go over the last picture for me please yeah uh, oh sorry this one sorry yes please thank you yes so uh, no that's a good presentation and very good correction of the deformity for sure uh i few principles uh that you know that what you have follow and what you uh elaborated here i will put the emphasis again number 1 this is a very unique problem that not everybody is capable of dealing or fixing it okay so that's number 1 number 2 when you are doing this uh ct scan you the way you mentioned ct scan is must for this patient number 2 you need to see in the axial view of the ct scan you need to see how much is the varus and valgus alignment subfibular impingement number 3 you need to make sure this patients like you know you ask them if they have any difficulty with the stairs or anti ankle pain then you do the distraction arthrodesis or you bring the calcaneal pitch back okay so that's uh, i mean that's a very important that you already mentioned this when i do this patients like you know i do ct scan take the patient in the surgery uh i start again you must be thinking this guy is crazy but one of the most deforming force for the calcaneus or if you want to bring the calcaneal pitch down is the achilles so i start with the achilles gastric resection or per tal for this patient so that helps me to that makes my life a little easier for this number 2 you can if i'm planning to do calcaneal osteotomy for varus valgus correction without distraction arthrodesis then i prefer to do two approaches one in sinus tarsi and one for the calcaneal osteotomy so i can do medial lateral uh you know displacement and from my sinus tarsi approach i decompress the i prepare the subtalar joint and i decompress the subfibular impingement removing the lateral wall and one thing the people who are not done this type of cases keep the x ray under axial view or salzman view throughout the surgery you can see that how much bone you need to remove or whether you have done the adequate decompression of it okay if this patient have anti ankle impingement or anti ankle pain uh like you know we do the distraction arthrodesis if i'm doing the distraction arthrodesis now my my approach is totally different uh i do the something we call postero lateral approach uh postero lateral approach just lateral to the achilles tendon it's gallis approach you do for the more of like in a number of time for the posterior malleolus approach that and i can see subtalar joint from there i prepare i can take the lateral wall of the calcaneus out from there and i put the autograph uh, the iliac crest tricortical autograph 
between the talus and calcaneus. Number two, when you are doing this, if you want to do distraction orthodesis, not the compression is important, but you want to prevent that, like, you know, loss of the height. So you do the fully threaded cancellous screws for that one, okay? And so that's very important when you do distraction orthodesis. Number three, if you don't feel comfortable or if you want to try out a little different way, I, in the last few years, I stopped distraction orthodesis, but I do subtalar preparation. And when I do the calcaneal osteotomy, I do the plantar medial lateral displacement as well as plantar displacement of the calcaneal osteotomy. So I can get the pitch by a plantar displacement of the calcaneus. It's a challenge, it's very painful. So I don't want you to try out from the beginning, but that's another way of creating the calcaneal pitch there. Uh, so, uh, but again, it's a tough case and uh, kudos to you that you, I mean, you are able to do this type of cases. Thank you. Yeah, good case, uh, Abhishek. Uh, yeah. Manoj sir, can we move to? Uh... Yeah, I think uh, we should move ahead for the last uh, case for today. Uh, so may I now invite Dr. Ankit uh, Khurana from Delhi, and uh, we will be presenting a complex uh, Liz Frank injury case. So over to Dr. Ankit. Hello, good evening. Uh, uh, I thank uh, Dr. Grish and Auto TV for this opportunity. And I'm presenting complex list frank injury. And before I go on to my case, because of uh, I don't have a lot of images for the case, I would, uh, you know, stick to key teaching points before I go to the case. Uh, so uh, complex list frank injuries, or for that matter, list frank injuries, can be either from an indirect mechanism, uh, which is the most common mechanism where uh, uh, where the dorsal ligaments uh, of the midfoot fail, uh, either by motor vehicle accidents or uh, sports injuries. And uh, they can be direct crushing of the foot as well with the uh, compartment syndrome or uh, an open fracture with significant soft tissue injury. And when one is evaluating for uh, subtle signs of a Liz Frank injury, one should look for uh, midfoot plantar ecchymosis, which is uh, fairly specific for this type of uh, type of an injury. And uh, it should give a clue when one should, you know, uh, uh, get his uh, antennas up for this type of an injury and look for it uh, very actively. Uh, one should also look for increased gap between the first and second uh, toes, uh, which indicates a subtle injury. Uh, tarsum and tarsal tenderness is something that one should always look for. And additionally, one should also look for something called a piano key sign uh, when one tries to uh, move the metatarsals in the, uh, 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 while stabilizing the hind foot to see for instability or movement at the joint and pain. And uh, pronation as well as abduction forces can be applied to the foot while stabilizing the hind foot, which also indicates a subtle disc frank injury. Uh, one should always get a weight-bearing x-ray when one is looking for these injuries because they help in visualizing the foot in a functional situation as well as to assess uh, whether there is instability uh, of the uh, Liz Frank joint or not. And uh, such innocuous x-rays can turn into grotesque x-rays uh, when, uh, uh, when, when one does a weight-bearing film on the, on the foot. And this is the setup that I use for my weight-bearing x-rays, which is uh, something that is, you know, uh, uh, something that everyone, all foot and ankle surgeons do very commonly now. And uh, so one always looks for subtle findings uh, or uh, signs on the x-ray to uh, rule out uh, Liz Frank injuries like the on the AP view, one can look for the lateral border of the uh, first metatarsal and uh, see whether it's lined with the middle cuneiform. Uh, the middle border of the uh, second metatarsal should be in line with the second cuneiform. The third metatarsal should be in line with the uh, third cuneiform on the oblique view. And on the oblique view, the fourth metatarsal should always be in line with the middle border of cuboid. And the lateral fifth metatarsal should not project more than five millimeters beyond the cuboid on the oblique view as well. So one should look for something called a flex sign. Uh, uh, in uh, which is basically an avulsion of the plantar Liz Frank ligament, uh, which is seen between the bases of the first and second metatarsal. One can see the gap between the first and second metatarsal, which should be equivalent to the uh, gap between the middle and the middle cuneiform. And on the lateral view, one should see whether the second metatarsal is continuous with the superior border of the cuneiforms, and there is no plantar or dorsal displacement of the metatarsal bases. So, uh, uh, in addition to these radiological findings. Uh, uh, one should go ahead and do a CT scan as well for these ligamentous injuries, especially when one is planning uh, uh, an operative intervention for these cases. 
uh, an MRI can help when the CT scan and the X-rays are rather inconclusive, and, they, and that can help in identifying ligamentous injuries as well. Uh, Weight-bearing CTs is something that has come up uh, very recently. Uh, unfortunately, the facility is not really available to me, but then uh, uh, to, to people who, whom, to whom it is available, one should always do weight-bearing CT scans as well. So this is the case. I'm sorry for the poor X-ray quality. A 40-year-old male, non-diabetic uh, with a road traffic accident. And uh, this was the patient had a swelling. This was a case that I, uh, that I did way back in 2016. This was a poor pure ligamentous injury. And uh, uh, this is the 3D uh, CT that was uh, done for this patient and uh, which showed the pole, pure ligamentous injury with no bony uh, injury. And uh, this soft tissue swelling was pretty severe to begin with. And uh, uh, in this patient, I attempted a close reduction. The close reduction was rather successful. The swelling came down in a week or, t a week, week or so. Around 10 days, the swelling was down. And then the patient was taken to OR for uh, final fixation. And uh, uh, this is the approach that I use. I use a dual approach. The first incision is between the first and second metatarsal. And uh, I, I tend to raise full thickness flaps, taking care of the neurovascular structures, the, uh, uh, the dorsalis pedis artery, the peroneal, the superficial and deep peroneal nerves. And the medial incision helps in visualizing the first, second and third metatarsal uh, cuneiform joints and helps in reduction of these joints uh, in a direct way. The second approach is taken along the fourth minute tarsal, keeping a good skin bridge between the two incisions. And uh, this incision helps in visualizing the fourth and fifth minute tarsal bases. And uh, uh, one should avoid the intermediate branch of the superficial peroneal nerve when one is going through this approach. And uh, 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 when the joints are visualized, in this case, I, I did a direct visualization of the TMD joints. The meritarsal fractures, if there are, uh, they should be addressed first. And the fixation should proceed from medial to lateral side. So this is the fixation that was done. Uh, screws were used to fix the uh, medial column to get rigid stability. And uh, for the lateral column, KYR fixation was done to fix the mobile lateral column. And uh, as a post-operative protocol, uh, I put these patients not weight bearing for a good 12 weeks. At six weeks, the KYRs come out uh, to, uh, from the lateral column. And uh, at about six months, I plan for hardware removal for these patients. And this is what the X-ray looked at. Uh, six months are down the line when the hardware was removed and uh, patient was also advised uh, uh, patient is uh, my patients are advised uh, uh, an insole with a with a uh, with an arch support uh, which they need for quite some time after this injury and this is another case that i had it is an isolated middle column injury uh, with uh, uh, the first uh, metatarsal base fracture this case was rather neglected and i put in a jest fixator and fused the first tmd joint for this case uh, another case with, uh, with uh, again, an isolated middle uh, column injury where a distraction plate was used. And this is a, uh, another middle column, isolated middle column injury, uh, metatarsal base fracture. This was an open fracture and a JS fixator was applied to this case. This is the CT scan of this patient. A JS fixator was applied and the first metatarsal base fracture was fixed. Uh, uh, to uh, and the soft tissue management was done simultaneously. So this is another so, uh, pure ligamentous injury uh, uh, Liz Frank injury with the uh, 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 that was uh, fixed with uh, screws for the middle column and KYS for the lateral column. And uh, when there is a fracture of the uh, of the metatarsals along with along with the ligamentous injury, like in this case, uh, I used uh, a plate to stabilize the fracture and the Liz Frank screws and the uh, tarsal metatarsal screws to fix the middle column and KYS for the lateral column. And this is what the excel looked like at uh, 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 I think three months of follow up that this was. And uh, to finally give the take home message, I would uh, drag everyone's attention to this uh, review article that is published in EFORT a couple of years back. And this sums up the entire literature that, that is available on list frank injury management. Uh, so there are six commandments that this article gives. And uh, the first one is that uh, to correctly diagnose and treat these injuries, one should understand the anatomy of the tarsal metatarsal joint. And uh, most of the uh, list frank injuries, especially the low, low velocity injuries, are. are pure ligamentous, and most of them are missed, about 20% as per this article. And they can lead to severe post-traumatic osteoarthritis that can lead to disabilities in the future. And it is a fair common cause of litigation as well. Weight-bearing radiographs and CTs can are compulsory when assessing these injuries. Uh, uh, the operative management should have, uh, the principle is to uh, uh, obtain stable fixation, but the only role of conservative management uh, in these cases is stable lesions without displacement. And that is the only role where conservative uh, treatment can be done for these injuries. 
and all other injuries require surgical treatment with the aim of obtaining an atypical reduction and rigid fixation of the first second and third cuneiform metatarsal joints and relatively uh, 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 not so rigid fixation for the uh, lateral column uh, the main controversies uh, regarding the lis frank injury management is osteosynthesis versus primary arthrodesis with current literature supporting arthrodesis especially for pure ligamentous injuries uh, transarticular screws should be preferred uh, i mean there is no preference but transarticular screws versus dorsal plates is something that is again controversial and uh, the most appropriate surgical the approach is again controversial with some surgeons going on to use a single uh, approach on the dorsum uh, along the third metatarsal and an additional medial approach but i tend to use dual approach along the which is the first one is between the first and second metatarsal and the third and the second uh, approach is on along the fourth metatarsal so the my preference is uh, open reduction internal fixation with transarticular screws and the use of dorsal plate is limited to combination of metatarsals and cuneiforms so that is what i prefer thank you thank you ankit uh, good presentation in the short period of the time uh, ankit few quick questions uh, so let's start from the evaluation then go to the treatment and then surgery so in your first evaluation i uh, i know the gross lis frank injury are very obvious on the x ray but let's talk on the subtle injuries for the young orthopedic surgeons so when uh, nothing is clear on the x ray and you have a big doubt that this is uh, how do you manage or how do you investigate such kind of injuries so when you my my go to is to look for clinical signs uh, like i mentioned i look for plantar ecchymosis and once i find plantar ecchymosis uh, the only exception that uh, mm. the differential diagnosis that i have other than a lis frank injury is a plantar fascia rupture which is again pretty rare and in addition to that i look for tenderness at the tarsometatarsal joint i see for the piano key sign and if any of that is positive i go for weight bearing x rays apart from my conventional x ray series an ap lateral mm. and an oblique view and an ap and lateral view in, in weight bearing and if there is any any shred of doubt uh, i i tend to advise them fixation otherwise uh, uh, as per you know there is a classification given by nunley et al that uh, you know classifies these into 1 2 and 3 type 1 2 and 3 so type 1 injuries are ones that don't really displace out when you put them under stress and those in- injuries can be managed in a cast boot non operatively as per the uh, you know findings of nunley and 2 uh, mm of displacement on a weight bearing a uh, radiograph from a non weight bearing is an indication of fixation 2 mm is something that cannot be measured again but then if you see any visible displacement that is different from the which is, which is visible with the naked eye that indicates that it is a unstable injury yeah mahesh sir uh, in your in your setup you have seen this kind of the similar injuries uh, sir how do you uh, how do you feel like how easy is for the patient to go for the weight bearing x ray on the same day of the injury Uh, it's very difficult to go for the weight bearing on the very first day. Uh, uh, so, how do you manage on the initial, like before the weight bearing? Yeah, uh, on clinical grounds, as uh, Dr. Ankit said, the diagnosis and piano sign, visible X-ray gap, uh, gap on the X-ray. Weight bearing X-ray is possible after uh, repeat X-ray after uh, say two, two to three days. And in some cases, uh, we can go for the MRI in uh, pure ligament test injury. Yes. Ashish sir, are you there, sir? Yeah, yeah, I'm. I, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, can we go for the CT scan directly in the subtle injuries when you see nothing on the X-ray? So um, I, I'm sorry if that is a poor connection and if you can't hear me. Okay, uh, so. any time when patient comes to see me if there is no plantar bruising or anything but there is tenderness in the lis frank area or the tmt i i do the mri okay first of all weight bearing x ray if the patient can weight bear the x ray you should weight bearing x ray bilateral so you'll be able to see some that's number 1 number 2 it's very important you look at the first tmt when you cannot see lis frank injury because first tmt normally the angle between the two metatarsal first and second is a 7 degrees if the first metatarsal has become more like a neutral that automatically tells you there is a first tmt instability secondary to the lis frank okay so that automatically tells you hey there is a lis frank injury here okay that's number 2 if i see if i don't see any instability if bilateral x rays are equivocal then i jump over the mri okay because 
MRI will tell me about the Lis Frank ligament injury because I don't see any displacement. So I need to do MRI to see the Lis Frank, I mean, that uh, ligamentous injury. If MRI shows a Lis Frank ligament injury, and the way Ankit mentioned that if it's less than two millimeter displacement, okay, then or uh, then I do with a non weight bearing casting treatment for this patient and gradual mobilization depending upon reduction of the tenderness. Okay, but you still need to do serial x rays for this patient. If there is more than two millimeter displacement, then I take them for surgery. If the patient comes with the displacement to begin with, which is apparent on the x ray, just even it's a ligamentous or it's a displacement, you must do CT scan to number one to see the other fractures through the base of the third, fourth, fifth metatarsals. Because when you fix this patient, they'll be still in pain, pain, pain at three months, four months, five months. So you need the documentation or you need to, you need to tell the patient, hey, you did not get just a Liz Frank injury. You have intraarticular fracture of four, five TMT and other fractures, you know? So it's very important you do CT scan when it's obvious on the X-ray that there is a Liz Frank injury. Now, fixation wise, again, whatever is available there, there is, I prefer not to put the screws except the list rank screw. I do the stabilization plate, like two hole stabilization plate, because I can, like when you are drilling, you can injure to the cartilage with a four millimeter drill bit, you know, four millimeter screw, the heat as well as drilling, you take away that much cartilage, right? So I, there is no way I can prove that, hey, with the screw, I develop more arthritis versus because of the injury, there was more arthritis, right? But right. You, you put all the efforts to avoid the arthritis as much as possible. So I do two whole plate for first and as well as where Anki showed beautifully when it's a combination, the length matters. So you put the three whole plate or two whole plate uh, mini frag. And I, I, I do the list frank screw. Uh, you can do from kidney form to metatarsal or you do metatarsal to kidney form, but make sure is bicortical. You are engaging all four cortices. This is positional screw. This is not the, uh, the interfragmentary screw that you try to achieve the compression through that. And you need to achieve all four cortices here to get the stabilization of that. In my practice, if the patient is 30 plus and non-athlete, I prefer to do primary fusion because these people, no matter what, they develop the arthritis, okay? So if they're non-diabetic, non-smoker, and if it's not polytrauma, okay? This is more like a community type of list, Frank. I go ahead and fuse them. So that, this is my take-home message, or this is what how I'm able to replicate this results of this patients uh, with this type of injuries. So if anyway, if you want to conserve or settle injuries when the displacement is not more than 2 mm, what is the period of immobilization time? Is the same like the other injuries or it is different? Like I, I use the, like, you know, again, uh, this is, again, the, it's a level six evidence, not even level five. It's expert opinion, I would say, you know. I do the, look at the local tenderness in this patient and if there is no if there is no tenderness and x-ray is not showing the displacement which comes down to in my population comes down to like six weeks so by six weeks or so slowly they're transitioning partial weight bearing to full weight bearing in a boot and then switching over to stiff sole shoes like you can say kolapuri sandals or you can put the carbon fiber plate in your shoes right yeah. Yeah. Ankit, can you please describe in short, like, what is your sequence of the fixation if you are opting open reduction internal fixation using screws? So, how you start with the first? So, uh, when I'm when there is no fracture, it's a pure ligamentous injury. I uh, go from medial to lateral. I do the medial approach first, and then uh, I stabilize the uh, uh, the second metatarsal with the medial cuneiform. I put in the list frank screw. Uh, initially, the screws that I put, used to put were from the middle cuneiform to the second metatarsal, but over time I realized that it is better to have a larger target and then put the screws from middle to lateral. And uh, the screws are mostly fully threaded. I Initially, I used to put partially threaded screws there, but uh, most of the screws now are fully threaded. 
and then the second uh, uh, screw that i put or the second fixation that i do is uh, uh, from the first metatarsal to the nail cuneiform and then if the third metatarsal base requires additional stabilization then i do that and then in in the final go when when i see that the entire uh, thing is stabilized i move to the lateral column and fix it with kevlar right. may i ask dr gadegone sir for many years you have used the screws for the this frank and now recently you have shifted for the extra articular breech plating so what is your experience sir in the long time like uh, when you from screws to plate uh, plate i actually it is very easy to assemble the plate over the fracture dislocation so in this present my order uh, now i think that the, if the surgery is very easy assembling is very easy, and maintaining the reduction while doing the surgery also very easy as compared to the screw precision because the four screw you are planning is done before you put the screw but when you do the only screw fixation the planning you have to do from one column to and third so sometime it is possible that you may uh, misguide yourself so that is my experience so i think plating is a, a worth uh, experience i do agree sir entirely with you but i think uh, there is uh, a, a probably north india or the problem is on the availability of proper plates even the local company that that you know we are all aware of that gives the implant uh, does not have the you know the complete uh, uh, the screw sizes or the you know, drill bit mismatch with all sorts of things that they give so uh, i do agree plates are better but then uh, with the um, cost and other things uh, i i think that uh, uh i i try to restrict my use of plates but then if better quality plates would have been available i would have definitely uh, used it used it much more yeah. when i started in that sorry yeah ashish sir please ashish sir i i agree with ankit it's and again in defending ankit ankit you know screw fixation is way harder than plating <laughs> uh, so it's a way harder you know Uh, yeah. so that's why when when i want to get out of the case sooner and i want my resident i make them to do the plating you know <laughs> but when I, i'm and when i do the midfoot fusion screw fixation if i'm doing then i do screw fixation when my fellows doing i make them to do plate fixation uh ankit when i started in nagpur i had the same problem uh, at that time the plate was not available so the just if you want a plate and if you don't have the option of that etched contour you can go for the 2.7 mm uh, t plate or the l plate provided you have to put a lis frank screw from the base of second metatarsal to the middle cuneiform the problem that i find with those uh, you know the metacarpal plates and the plates that are used for facial maxillary injuries is that they are quite uh, malleable you know if you can even so bend it with your 2.7 mm lower end radius which is okay, 2.7 okay. mm i i agree okay now no, i get your point not 2 mm okay this is yeah. like firm enough and locking plates are better so yeah yeah but you can have a mold because your 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 junction of the midfoot to the forefoot it takes some mold mm -hmm. so you can take the mold also i think there is something that i used recently was the uh, anterior yeah. cervical plates that i used for you know uh, the acdf mm -hmm. plates i have used a few in in a few of my midfoot fusions but uh, not in this frank injuries yet but in a few of my midfoot fusions i think i can try that but the idea that you're giving is again i take it Right. So Manoj, yeah, good discussion, Ankit. Yeah, yeah. Manoj. Manoj, now. Yes. Sir. I, I think, think, sir, we are we are willing time, and if there are any questions for all the expert faculties or even these faculties, then we will take one or two questions, and then I think Girish could have the concluding remarks and the take home messages. So, any questions from the any faculties for? so i think there are no further questions already i think we we do have a very good uh, interactive discussions throughout chandak sir yes sir chandak yeah. sir wanted to say yeah. some yes any specific anti edema measures you undertake after the treatment extra when patients have residual edema in their foot any specific things achal dhanyawad uh, for less frank injuries or yeah for for foot injuries in general and okay, so my protocol is again it is a fairly basic protocol of limb elevation icing uh, with an, uh, with an ice gel pack and uh, serrashipeptidase combinations and whenever possible i try to attempt close reductions some people try to uh, take the patient to ot in a stage manner where they uh, reduce it under fluoroscopy and put kevars to reduce the uh, 
uh, fracture to begin with and then they do a second stage where they do the definitive fixation okay. uh, i unfortunately don't have much of an experience with that yeah. i tend to try to close reduce the fracture to the uh, close reduction and if close reduction yeah. fails i do uh, all the above mentioned methods and then wait for the swelling to go down to like and do a definitive fixation okay. yeah. yeah further extension to this question uh, have you any time seen the compartment syndromes especially the lis franks or even the chopard or these injuries and how do you assess if there is a compartment i think it is more to do with the uh, uh, you know okay. it is more a subjective uh, thing than than i think there is no objective uh, you know measures un- unless one can go ahead and measure the compartment pressure directly uh, it is more of a subjective yeah. decision and when i find that the patient is starts to complain of uh, you know there is paresthesia or decreased capillary refill it, it becomes a bit too late but then uh, i have had i think one patient where i had to do a a, a fish shot me and the incisions are pretty much same as the ones that are used subsequently for fixation and if 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 there is a need for uh, a fish shot me then i would put in the cave as an external fixator at the, at the same time so that uh, you know the fix, fracture is taken care of and the soft tissue is managed as well but that is the only indication of putting cave as in a list frank Uh, as a as a method of fixation otherwise yeah. Yeah. give us a restrict no no the definitive rigid fixation is needed for this plan yeah 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 thank you ankit for uh, that excellent presentation and we do have certainly good interactive questions during each individual cases as well so now i request uh, dr girish motwani to have the concluding remarks few take home messages and yeah. local so, before i before i uh, Yeah, yes, sir. In many of these uh, foot injuries, I know there is no clear-cut evidence. But uh, if the patient is young, is non-diabetic, and a good host, I never worry giving them steroids. Uh, I straight away give them one or two shots of uh, Dexa to them. And personally, I have seen a definite reduction in the swelling and the edema later on. Again, many of the distal radial fractures also post fixation. They really start mobilizing and quite comfortable later on. I don't have any evidence to support it, but uh, I still do it in some cases. So, do you have some fear of infection when you're doing that? Yes. Okay. Uh, there are uh, not more than two shots of Dexa. They are not a continuous type of. Yes. Can I ask you one more question? What I do? Yes, Abhishek. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, more injuries, whether it be the ankle, calcul, and foot. Whenever there is injury or sprain, there will be a lot of swelling because of gravitation flow and other things. So, I do. all the cases cryotherapy there is a cuff there is there is a lot of companies we make regularly what we do we put ice packs that is not very effective in cryotherapy there is a jacket for and that come and jacket and it is connect container which is what Yeah, what Dr. Jain wants to say is cold compression limit, and yeah, cold compression. Yeah, and temperature drops to four degrees Celsius, and there is arcuate result very safe, and there is just limb elevation and then jacket. Even the mid major swelling, seventy seven is phenomenal, and you need not, and then you can go to surgical procedures. Calculate. Hello. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. even after calculating or if, now we don't give any about cast. We just give a dressing after forty hours. I start. I start this cryotherapy and allow mobilization at subtalar and ankle joint, which gives me great results. Yeah, Nitin sir. Nitin sir. Nitin. Sir, uh, I uh, want to make a point regarding that foot compartment syndrome. Uh, What will be the sequelae of that uh, foot compartment syndrome? Might be some clawing of the toes. I don't think that there should be any uh, point in releasing that compartments with three incision there and then do a plastic surgery for that. I don't think that it should be needed in that. Uh, that it's just a clawing of toes. What we can get in a long term uh, sequelae as in compartment syndrome. But if it is an infected and then tendons are exposed, 
Once the flap is uh, then necrosed, and we can have a lot of plastic surgery measures to uh, get the correct correction of that intrusions. Uh, do agree, sir. But uh, the only thing that changes is fixation methods. When 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 one has a compartment syndrome, the fixation you know entirely changes. Yeah, I yeah. I, 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 I agree with you completely. Girish, we will yes, now conclude. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so before I go for the closing remark and concluding remark, I would like to thank Dr. Ashisha and uh, Dr. Vinod Panchbavi for uh, for the valuable contribution in the academic the young. orthopedic forum that which you have recently started in just a second webinar i hope this webinar is also a super successful like the last one and uh, uh, so today we had a, a great five speakers from all around india and we have started with the parth uh, parth he he was my junior in baroda medical college uh, he uh, has done a and in his case presentation he has nicely mentioned about the importance of the dual approach and the technical uh, problems regarding the fixation of the complex talus uh, after uh, his talk dr mahesh soni from the ankaleshwar he has nicely uh, demonstrated a bad case of the talus uh, talus fracture compound injury uh, theme about the soft tissue management uh, future counseling about the wound complication arthritis implant related problem and the talar avian from his case they are remarkable and it should be uh, it should be like well informed to the patient this is what the big learning from uh, the expert panelists uh, uh, dr vinod panchbavi he was a great contributor in the indian foot and ankle society academics he uh, has nicely mentioned the importance of the fusion in the talar avian although he has directly started with the management but in the discussion part he has nicely mentioned about the conservative role conservative management in the talar avian but the presence of the arthritis and the collapse he said these cases should be managed with the hind foot fusion one important learning point from his talk is tibio talo calcaneal nail fusion in the bad position it is even more painful than the primary talar avian so if you are doing a fusion do it in the right this was a good <clears throat> learning point after that talk i have uh, i have uh, talked on the calcaneal fracture with the poor soft tissue and i try to put the of the uh, the uh, sinus stars approach which like the balance between the percutaneous and the lateral extensile approach and the importance of this approach in complicated situations uh dr abhishek jain my good friend from delhi uh he has very nicely presented a bad case of talar av at i mean the uh, calcaneal man union uh, with the lateral wall exostosis but he said uh, after 6 month my patient will reach to delhi it is a bad thing like uh, this is the unacceptable <laughs> the thing from his presentation otherwise i would agree the importance of the distraction block uh, subtalar fusion It's only required. only when you are in Goa for the vacation when the patient has come to you. But six months it is not possible. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you have nicely mentioned the importance of the distraction block subtalar fusion and the importance of the talar declination, which is I think a good learning point for all the cases of the talar. I mean the calcaneal malunion. And after that, Ankit, uh, you have very nicely covered the list frank. It's a very big topic, but you have nicely covered in ten minutes, including the cases also. And good learning points were how not to miss the list frank importance of the weight bearing X-rays and the sequence of the open reduction interfixations. Thank you, Ankit, and all the other faculties for uh, for the important contribution. And uh, let me thank Dr. Gadegoni sir again. Uh, for for uh, giving the, uh, one more important chance to the budding orthopedic surgeon and i think uh, without your contribution and without your guidance we would have not arranged the uh, beautiful webinar which was conducted today yes giris so, next to yes. webinar topic will be on infection around the ankle and foot yes sir Active yes sir on yes. infections note noted sir hmm. uh, let me thanks dr manoj pawkar sir who is always with me 
for all yeah. small small uh, instruction to all big suggestions and i would say this is like the backbone of the uh, young orthopedic uh, webinar and without his contribution it is absolutely a difficult task for me to conduct a smooth webinar and uh, let me thank the other panelists chandak sir uh, nitin kimatkar sir yogesh sir and lokhande sir for your valuable time and contribution and thanks to everyone ortho tv neeraj sir uh, for your important contribution for the for the live telecasting and a smooth connection between the us and the indian thank you sir thank you everyone thank you girish thank you thank you everybody yeah. it was a wonderful celebration by all yeah and a, and a big clap for both the moderators wonderful mm, no. Wonderful. Yeah. Clap for everyone. Yeah. Uh, uh, are 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 we off the air now?